make sure that we are not allowing the baggage uh, from our past uh, to impede upon our work and our service to you. We ask this prayer in faith and we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this morning, uh, again, the topic of our lesson uh, continued from the series that we began last month on the third Sunday of the paradigm shift of the love of Christ. And today we looked at uh, rejection. We understand that uh, the paradigm, again, is uh, the normal way or, or our normal way of thinking and looking at things. And these things uh, shape the way in which we live. And a paradigm shift is uh, when we learn something new and in a different way, and it changes the way that we used to think. Amen, somebody. So the love of Christ has caused a paradigm shift in us. In other words, as children of the Most High God, uh, we no longer need to live in our old nature. We no, need, we no longer need to think uh, the way we used to think about things. We now have a new nature. We, have, we now have a new way of thinking, and that's all due to the love of Christ. Uh, as we said earlier, oftentimes uh, we fall into the trap of allowing ourselves uh, to be measured and defined uh, by someone or something other than God. And the enemy knows that whoever and whatever uh, we allow ourselves to be defined by, to that we also yield and give dominion and power over us. Uh, as we pointed out this morning, uh, the paradigm shift of the love of Christ has turned our rejection into acceptance. So while we may be continually rejected in this life, we are accepted with him and understand that uh, we are accepted with him because uh, not because of who and what we are but we are accepted of him because he has made us accepted you see as we talked about earlier in and of ourselves we would still stand rejected because we're in and of ourselves we're nothing without Christ amen somebody is that all right but the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 in the verses 3 through 6, as we read earlier, Ephesians chapter 1 in the verses 3 through 6, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, every spiritual blessing. Is that all right? In the heavenly places in Christ. Amen, somebody. So we need to stop looking at things, possessions, and, and things in this life as if it's a blessing. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Notice where? In the heavenly realms. God gives us something that we can't purchase, that we can't buy. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? Notice, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And as we pointed out earlier, when we looked at Acts chapter 10 and the verses 34 and 35, we saw in there that God is not a respecter of persons, but all who fear him and every nation that fears him and, and works righteousness is accepted with him. Is that all right? So as being adopted, we're not treated by God as second class or, or a stepchild or something like that. We are children of the most high God. Is that all right? He says, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which, notice, by which he made us 
accepted in the beloved. And as we stated earlier, and I'm just doing this to recap and refresh us, this accepted means it refers to the one who is in Christ, who is highly favored and approved because of having received or having been endowed with the grace that comes from God. You see, our acceptance in God has nothing to do with who you and I are. Our acceptance in God is based only in who Christ is and what Christ has done for us. Is that all right? And his acceptance is the only acceptance that you and I will ever need. Amen. So now this evening we want to ask the question, how did Christ in his humanity, how was he able to deal with rejection? The word of God says in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Lord have mercy. John 1.11 says he came to his own people and even they rejected him. Then Jesus said himself in Mark chapter 6, in verse 4, Jesus told them a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and in his own family. You see, we need to get back and understand again what rejection is. And I hope those of you who were here earlier don't mind for me repeating this, but rejection, again, in this context, refers to one who is forsaken and refused by others. Uh, this can be a parent, this can be family, close loved ones, friends, peer groups, society, or a community of people as a whole. In a broader sense, rejection is defined as the hurt and the pain and disappointment that one may experience due to a decrease in their sense of acceptance, inclusion, and belonging with others. And again, whether that be their parents, family, friends, peers, groups, or community. As we stated earlier, rejection can cause severe emotional and cognitive consequences, many of which are self-inflicted. This happens by increased feelings of depression, anxiety, sadness, low self-worth and esteem, anger, jealousy, and bitterness, can also produce inward fears, which can cause us uh, to have an obsessive need to control and dominate in order to avoid feelings of vulnerability, regardless of if it pertains to people, things, or situations. And as we uh, pointed out this morning, rejection hurts. Rejection is painful. And we noted this morning that rejection, when you and I experience rejection, it feels so painful because MRI studies have shown that when we experience rejection, the very same area of the brain is being used as when we experience physical pain. So that's why when we 
are rejected, we feel like it's a punch in the gut or somebody stabbing us in the back. It hurts that much. And rejection goes hand in hand with abandonment. And this is the reason why rejection, especially from a parent or a caretaker, can be so devastating because it destabilizes our basic fundamental need for acceptance and validation. You see, when this is uh, impeded, it can cause chronic depression, self-doubt, low self-esteem and worth, inferiority complexes, and it can cause us to have a critical spirit towards our own selves. And these things are not just experience for the moment, but they can persist all the way up into our adulthood where, where it affects and impedes upon all aspects of our lives there. So it can affect our marriages. It can affect our parenting. It can affect our relationships, our employment, our career, and socially how we engage with others. But I want you to know this. The enemy works to use rejection in order to send us on a mission to seek and destroy our own self-esteem and worth and our own confidence. And this causes us, when this happens, it, it causes us uh, to seek our identity in things, in people, in possessions, in status, in appearance that perceivably will, will help us to win the love and attention and most of all, the acceptance of other people. So you see, Satan is the originator of identity theft. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Satan wants to keep you and I from knowing who we truly are. And as we pointed out this morning, who we truly are is not that old way that old nature and old way of thinking. That's not who we are. That old way of life, that carnal life is a lie. He wants to keep us from the new nature, from the new way of thinking, from the new man, watch this, which is created in righteousness and true holiness after the image of him who created him. So watch this, we are created in the image of God. And God has given us his divine power so that we can partake of his divine nature and escape that worldly life. But as we say that this morning, the question is, if God has given us his divine power that, ha that has freed us and helped us to escape that old nature, why do we insist why do we insist on continuing to live in that old nature? Why do we put all of our efforts into that old nature so that someone, amen, can accept us in this life? You see, I want you to go with me to John chapter 8. Because we need to look at the standard. I could have went to Joseph. Because Joseph dealt with rejection. Amen, somebody. He was sold by his own brothers. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? He had a dream. His father had an issue with the dream. But his father took note of it. You see... We need to understand that if God be for you, who can be against you? Amen. But we want to look at John chapter 8, starting with verse 31, because we want to look at Jesus and his humanity. You see, 
Sometimes when we think of Jesus, we think that Jesus used his prerogatives as God in his humanity, and he never did. Jesus never, when he was faced with a situation, he never snapped his fingers to get through the situation. He had to deal with the situation just like you and I. That's why you ever notice Jesus prayed a lot. Amen, somebody. He prayed a lot. Even sometimes he told his disciples, y'all go on ahead, get away from me so I can go and pray. And sometimes we just need to tell our, our kinfolk and our family, get away from me so I can go and pray. Are we getting this? John chapter 8. John chapter 8, starting with verse number 31. I'm going to try to get through here, all right? John chapter 8, starting with verse 31. If you have to say amen. The word of God says, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, who believed him, because you had some who believed in him, but wouldn't confess him because they were scared to be put out of the synagogue by the Jews. Amen, somebody. I pray to God that there's no Christians at the Church of Christ at the Boulevard who's scared and ashamed to admit that they are Christians because they're afraid of what people will think of them. Are we getting this? He says, if, if you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed or truly. And you shall what? Know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Is that all right? You ever notice the more and more and more you get into God's word and you begin to grow, the less and less and less you care about what people think of you? The less you want to fit in, the, the, the more you realize, first of all, you don't fit in, and the less you want to fit in. Amen. I wish our young people could really know, I wish they can get a glimpse so that they wouldn't spend 30 and 40 and 50 years of their life trying to fit in with people who don't really matter anyway. Try to fit in with people that's going to be the same spot 40 years from now, they'll be where you left them. Are we getting this? He says they... He said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Verse 33, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you, you will be made free? You see, sometimes people who oppose the truth are deceived. Are we getting this? They go, they, they, they're actually going to sit up there and tell a bold-faced lie that they never been enslaved. Do they not remember the Babylonian captivity? That's just one. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. You see, Jesus is talking spiritual. They think in physical, but Jesus is saying, because y'all are not receiving the truth, y'all still in y'all sins. And you're a slave to your sin. You're a slave to your old nature. And many times, watch this, we can even be baptized and in the body of Christ and still be a slave to our old nature and the old way of thinking. Watch this. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. Or a servant does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Jesus is going deep on them. He said, a servant does not remain in the house, but the son abides or remains forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, understand what Jesus is saying. Watch this. A servant or a slave can't always abide in a house because they don't know if they're going to be sold or not. But the Son, not only does he remain, not, not only does he have the right to remain in the house forever, but he has the power and authority to make the slaves free. Y'all ain't getting that. 
That's why he says son. He said if the son makes you free, then you are truly free. And they knew exactly what he was saying. You trying to say you the son of God? You see, when you look at John uh, chapter uh, 5, John chapter 5, watch this. John chapter 5 in the verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, my father works hitherto and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. You see, in Jewish culture, the son of a father had the equal rights to the father. So whatever the father owned, the son owned. So Jesus is saying, whatever my father has, I have the same authority. So if the son sets you free, then you're truly free. Amen, somebody. Are we getting this? Notice then, back to John chapter 8. Notice verse 37. I know, watch this. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me. Because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father. With my father. Are you getting this? And you do what you have seen with your father. Now he's making a distinction. My father. Your father. Amen. Amen. And in the world, we know whose father they are. are. Are we getting this? We know who the world's father is. And we need to be careful because even in here, amen, some of us are still, from time to time, amen about it. Watch this. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Abraham was known as what? The father of faith, right? But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. So in other words, you're not doing what Abraham did because Abraham was a man of faith. You're doing the deeds of your father. Now here we go. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Now you need to read between the lines because now they're getting down and dirty. We're not born of fornication. Who are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus. They're trying to say, you are Ill you're going to tell us who our father is, man? You, you illegitimate. You were born of fornication. Who are you talking to? Is that all right? Are we getting this? So now he's experiencing some defiance. They were insinuating that Jesus was born illegitimately. They're defying him. They're, they're calling him what is known, and I don't mean to offend, they're calling him what is known as a bastard. All right? Notice then, verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. I'm sorry, let me, let me go on, 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. You see, Jesus didn't mince words. Amen, somebody. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. 
which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Oh, now nah, they're mad. You ever tell somebody the truth in love? And they just waiting for you to finish so that they can respond because you see the smoke coming out their ears? Look at what they say in verse 48. Watch this. Then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and, and have a devil or demon? Now, at face value, we may not understand how horrible this is. But understand this. Now they go from defiance to dishonor. And if calling him a Samaritan wasn't bad enough, they say he had a devil. You see, they're attacking both his physical and spiritual heritage. Samaritans were a mixed race of Jews who coincided or, or cohabitated with heathens. So those Samaritans were people who the Jews didn't deal with at all. They were mixed breeds. Amen, somebody. Are we getting this? You remember in John 4 and verse 9, the woman at the well? And she said, how is it that you're asking me for, for a drink? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? The Jews looked down at Samaritans. They were, to the Jews, the Samaritans were the scum of the earth. So they not only called him a Samaritan, but they have the nerve to say, you got a devil in you. Is that all right? Notice then, verses 49 and 50. Look how Jesus responds. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now, here's the key, and I, I want to just close it in on this. In the face of being rejected, defied, and dishonored, Jesus, we need to take some notes. Jesus had already lost himself in the work and service of his father. So, losing himself, there's nothing that they can really say to get under his skin. Because he's so preoccupied and focused on his father's will. Lord have mercy, if we can just get focused on the will of God and not be so concerned with what people are saying and what people are doing and what people think of us. Is that all right? You see, in Luke 2, 49, at the age of 12, Jesus said, how is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Even at the age of 12, Jesus knew he had a purpose. In John 4, 34, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You see, in verses 51 through 57, we have more ridicule and rejection. And we need to understand that Satan uses rejection to discredit us, to discourage us, and to deprive us of who we truly are. You see, the point is this. Jesus dealt with rejection like this. He didn't allow rejection to rob him of who he truly was. Jesus always knew who he was. Are y'all getting this? Jesus always knew who he was, or more importantly, who 
he belonged to. You and I need to understand who we truly are, but most importantly, who we belong to. Because when we understand that we belong to God, then we won't have an urge and a preoccupation with belonging to people in the world. Y'all will get this when you get home. Notice. Verse 57, they said, then the Jews, then said the Jews unto him, thou art not 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus gets real now. Amen, somebody. You see, sometimes you just have to just, uh, what the old people used to say, just tell it like it is. Jesus said unto them, truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, before Abraham was, y'all are putting all this stock in Abraham. Before Abraham was, I, I am. And that's exactly how it reads in the Greek. I, I am. In other words, he, he's being emphatic and saying, ego a me. I, I am. And they knew exactly what that meant. He was saying, I, I am God. And that's why in verse 59, they took up, then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. You see, watch this. Even in his humanity, our Savior never allowed for the enemy to use rejection to rob him from his true identity. We have to honestly ask ourselves, what and who are we allowing in this life to rob us and steal from us our true identity? Amen, somebody. You see, even while being rejected on the cross, and Christ experienced being rejected, but watch this, even to a point of having to endure rejection by his own father. Now watch this, when he says, Eli, Eli, that means my God, my God. Lama means why, but then he says, Sabachthani, or Sabachthani. This refers to a cry of distress of one who is in intense suffering. And it actually means you have left me. That's what Jesus cried out. You have left me. But watch this. He took it. He took it. The question is why? He took that rejection. So that you and I wouldn't have to. You see, even in that, Jesus never lost himself. 
that rejection could have been so painful that he said, no, that's it, that's it, that's enough. We're going to stop right here. But he knew who he was and what his purpose was. And he fulfilled his purpose. Are you and I fulfilling our purpose? Or are we burdened and heavy laden with all of these things in life, abandonment, rejection, abuse, worthlessness? Are we allowing the U-Haul of baggage weigh us down from fulfilling our purpose in Christ Jesus? This is not an easy thing to talk about. And I don't want to make it seem at all as if this is something that we can just get over in the night. Because truth be told, it wasn't one night that got us into whatever we experienced. But I'm here to tell you, God is faithful to his promises. He's faithful and he can heal us of all of our infirmities. And watch this. Understand that the healing is not always just for you. Many times we need to understand that the healing is for somebody else to see so that we can help somebody else with their faith. You see, if Jesus, after he was resurrected, if he didn't still have the prints in his wrist, the pierce in his side, would Thomas ever have believed? So maybe God will heal us, but we'll still have the scars to be reminded how good God is but we'll also be able to show somebody else God is able. Amen, somebody. I've said enough. If you're here today and you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can come have me heard the word. Faith comes by hearing him by the word of God. Do you believe it? Are you willing to repent of your sins, confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and be buried in baptism for the remission, for the forgiveness of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God has, through his son, through the love of Christ, he's forever changed our perspective on rejection. He's turned whatever rejection we have in this life, whatever rejection we've experienced, he's turned that in to being accepted. Embrace, I encourage you, embrace the acceptance from God. And once you do, you'll never need it from anybody or anything else. For those of us who have obeyed the gospel, many of us are hurting. Are y'all hearing me? Many of us are hurting. Hurting. We're hurting. And we need one another. And guess what? The enemy is a liar because he's telling us, well, everybody else got it together. And the way we think that we ought to cope with things is by ourselves and alone. When we need to actually be confessing our faults to one another so that we can pray for one another and with one another. Why? The Bible says so that we can be truly healed. See, when we talk about calling people and asking how you're doing, we're, we're not just talking about things of, you know, do you, do you need $5? Do you need me to come and take you somewhere? Or do, no, some of us need some help with some, some heavy things. We need help, guess what? Because we're trying to make it to heaven. I've said enough again.
Consider what you ask me together, stand and sing the words of encouragement.